Welcome to Martial Arts World Radio. I'm your host, Joseph Clark. Over the next hour, we have three guests, which include UFC fighter and star of the Ultimate Fighter and American Top Team, Saba Homassi. We also have martial arts champion and trainer to the American Gladiators, David Crapes, and female kickboxing sensation, boxing world champion, and cinema stunt performer and actor, Bridget Baby Doll Riley. I have a book to bring to your attention. Check out 21st Century Perspectives on Martial Arts at Amazon. Also, if you're interested in UFC and Everlast Apparel, video games, and training equipment, check out our show website at www.mawradio.com. This week's inspirational quote is from the great Anderson Silva and goes as follows. I'm not the best. I just believe that I can do things that people think are impossible. The great Anderson, the Spider Silva. Hi, I'm Bob Wall, a world full contact karate champion, and I'm the co-star of Into the Dragon. You're listening to Martial Arts World Radio with Joseph Clark. Saba Hamasi is a welterweight fighter who has fought in several professional fight promotion companies, including Bellator and now the UFC. He was a member of American Top Team for the Ultimate Fighter television series season entitled America Top Team vs. Black Zillions. Saba, welcome to Martial Arts World Radio. Thanks for having me. Saba, tell us how you chose the nickname The Problem. Two of my buddies that I live with gave me the nickname The Problem. They're like, man, you're just a problem in every way you look at it. So it kind of like just stuck from there. And so now you're presenting a problem to your opponents. Yes, sir. You have fought in both the UFC and Bellator. How did the two fight promotion companies compare from a fighter experience? Uh, it was both great experiences. You know, um, Bellator is a great organization, and so is the UFC. But, of course, uh, I mean, now Bellator is run differently than, than when I was with them. So it's kind of like the strike force, that, like pretty much strike force all over again because it's all the same guys that run it. But other than that, I can't, you know, I have nothing bad to say about either or, both great companies. You participated on The Ultimate Fighter during a season that will probably go down in history, a very notable season. You were representing America Top Team. Tell us about that experience. Uh, it was great, man. You know, it was um, definitely a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And, of course, I had to jump on board. And, uh, you know, you're locked in the house for six weeks. You're disconnected from the world, you know, no cell phone, you don't see your friends and family. Only benefit was that uh, since it was team versus team, you were with your coaches and teammates and you wouldn't have to fight each other. It was based off a point system, so, and no one got eliminated. So it was completely different than a regular season, which was pretty neat. Um, I don't think they'll ever do it again, but the whole experience is great, you know. Um, Anything you wrote down on a piece of paper appeared the next day. <laughs> Groceries or anything you needed, just write it down and it's there. Um, and it was just, honestly, it was just another day. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't that bad. I'm sure the other guys that have been on other seasons will say it's, their season was tougher because it probably was. You know, I'm training at my gym um, with my coaches and my teammates. You can't ask for anything better than that, you know. Saba, how long have you trained with American Top Team? Uh, I've been with American Top Team since 2008. It was very apparent when watching the television show that there was a brotherhood and a real sense of loyalty within the team. Oh, uh, absolutely. It's great. You know, um, you know, like you said, it's, it's a brotherhood. We're smart when we train, and uh, we just we put in work. You know, it's just another day in the gym. So we go in there, we train together. And uh, all today, we take care of each other at the same time, you know. And what does your training regimen look like presently? Uh, presently, I'm training, you know, two, three, four times a day. So I'm just constantly in the gym preparing for the next fight. Uh, my coaches, you know, I have great people on board with me, so they know when I need a break. If I need a break, so they'll cut a session if I need to. It depends on how my body feels. Um, so, you know, recovery is very important. So I'm on top of my ice bath and 
training and my diet. So everything's on point and running smoothly. Are you able to balance relationships and a social life while training to be a world champion? Absolutely. Doing it right now. Saba, would you elaborate on this point a little bit? Because we do a lot of interviews with both UFC fighters and former world champions from uh, kickboxing and full contact karate. And a very common answer that we get is that they had to learn how to balance their relationships or relationships suffered in the pursuit of becoming a champion. So I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on that. Well, you know, it kind of comes down to your partner as well. So my girlfriend is um, she's very supportive of what I do. So she understands. And uh, she actually comes with me to some training sessions, uh, works out with me sometimes, and so it's main thing is you got to find someone who supports you and, you know, will do anything for you. And I have that. So she, she understands, she sees what I go through day in and day out. And she's just very supportive of that. So, you know, I come home and, um, you know, she, she'll cook my food up or whatever the case might be. And we just relax mainly. And she knows I need my rest. So, but of course, on the weekends, we'll, you know, go to dinner, go to movies. We'll hang out with friends. You still got. You still need a. You got to unplug from time to time, you know. And um, end of the sure. week on Saturdays, you know, that's my day to wind down and disconnect from, you know, the whole MMA team. Just disconnect my brain from fighting about thinking about fighting, and yes. uh, spend time with my girlfriend. Sabe, it sounds like you have a good partnership there, and she's giving you a lot of great support. Yeah, definitely. With all of the fight promotion companies that exist now, and with all of the many fighters in the UFC, is it becoming increasingly more difficult to stand out and be noticed as a fighter? Um, you know, I think it all depends on your fighting style. If you're an exciting fighter, I don't think it's going to be that hard to be, you know, I don't think it's going to be hard for you to stand out. You know, you, you build a big fan base that loves your fighting style, and once you have enough attention on you, you will be recognized. But it is very hard. You know, it's not, it's easier said than done. But, mm -hmm. you know, you just got to go with it, stick with it, fight hard, and leave it out there every time you step into the octagon. Do you have hobbies that you participate in when you're not training MMA? Yeah, I love playing sports, man, but it's the only time I get to play sports is when I don't have a fight coming up. I don't want to do something stupid and get injured playing basketball or football or bat, you know, tennis or whatever it is, and then I'm, I'm out of a fight. So that's kind of the hardest part, but it's not like I have time to do that anyways, you know. But, yeah, I love playing sports. And growing up, who were some of the influences in your life? I would have to say my older brother. <laughs> you know, everything he did, I did. So he has a huge impact on my life, so. Saba, who is your favorite martial artist? I have to go with Bruce Lee, man. And that is definitely the most common answer I hear. You, you can't go wrong with that. It's like Bruce Lee's the man. No, you definitely can't go wrong with that. You definitely can't. Do you consider yourself a martial artist first or a pro athlete first? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm a pro athlete. You know, I compete at the highest level, and um, it's not easy to get here. And once you do get here, it's you know, the hard work just keeps coming because you got to bust your ass to stay here. And Saba, presently, who would be the most important or influential relationships in your life? Yeah, I mean, people, my coaches, I guess, you know, good relationship with your coaches. If you don't have a good relationship with your coaches, you're not going to, you're not going to grow as a fighter, you know. If your coaches don't like you, if you don't have a good relationship with them, they're not going to put the time into you. And do you have a philosophy that you can share with our listeners on overcoming defeat and learning from losses so that you actually come out of them stronger? Absolutely. Um, you know, if you, if you keep thinking about a loss, you'll never, you'll never grow. You'll never move on. You got to learn how to put that behind you, learn from it, and uh, make sure you don't make those mistakes or, you know, whatever the case might be, you make sure that you, it doesn't happen again. Saba, what goals have you set for yourself for the near future? 
I'm aiming to be one of the best mixed martial artists out there. So um, I'm learning every day. I'm getting better every day. You know, I don't put, I don't limit myself. So I'm looking to become a world champion one day, and it will happen in my near future because I'm putting in the work. I'm putting in the time. I'm busting my ass on a daily basis. My hard work is definitely going to pay off. Saba, this is our wrap-up question, and I thank you very much for your time this evening and for your candor. As a fighter who is fighting at the highest level and who has accomplished so much already, do you have advice for our young listeners or our martial artists that are listening tonight who have their sights set on becoming champions and fighting in the UFC? Absolutely. Sacrifice. Sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. Sacrifice a bunch, and it'll all pay off. You make all these sacrifices now, you put your hard work in, and it'll all pay out in the end. That's a promise. Stay away from anything that's a distraction, and just surround yourself with positive people, good people, and you'll be going down the right path. Saba, that sounds like great advice, not just for martial arts, but for any worthwhile pursuit. Thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate your time tonight. We wish you all the very best. No problem. Thanks for having me. This has been an interview with UFC fighter Saba Hamasi on Martial Arts World Radio. This is Olivier Gruner. You are listening to Martial Arts World Radio with Joseph Clark. For those of you listening to Martial Arts World Radio well on your phones, tablets, or laptops, be sure to check out www. BobWallWorldBlackBelt.com. That's BobWallWorldBlackBelt.com, the world's foremost martial arts online community. Also, check out our show website for the advertisement for London Sports. London Sports is a provider of quality sports apparel and equipment at factory prices, which you can brand with your own organization's distinctive logo to resell to your members and customers. Just visit www.mawradio.com and click on the London Sports logo to send your inquiry. David Crapes is an accomplished martial artist with a lifelong legacy of overcoming adversity. He is a coach and trainer of champion fighters and has also trained some of the contestants and cast of the American Gladiators television show. I had the pleasure of interviewing David recently as we enjoyed a coffee together at the home of martial arts legend Bob Wall. The coffee was great. The interview even better. Here is that interview. David, thanks very much for speaking with us today. So tell us about your training with some of the contestants of American Gladiators. I was fortunate enough to have met uh, Johnny Ferraro, uh, who is the producer and creator of American Gladiators, and he introduced me to his partner, which is Dan Carr, and they asked me to come out to uh, Orlando, Florida, and participate as a uh, as you could say, kind of security slash bodyguard slash, you know, uh, referee. <laughs> and I ended up getting to meet all the gladiators for the first time. And what a great career I've had because of that. And uh, it was enjoyable. It was uh, the best two years of my life. Very good. But as I understand it, they, uh, they came to you voluntarily to train with you. It wasn't as though the show had hired you for that specific purpose. No, they didn't really hire me for that uh, specific reason. The reason why they hired me is because of my background as a martial artist, and uh, they they wanted me to handle all the security for them. And so I said, yeah, why not? What what a great opportunity. So when I showed up there, the gladiators heard that I was a martial artist, so a lot of them jumped at the opportunity and said, hey, Dave, can you train me? And I said, sure, why not? This will be interesting. I, I love athletes, first of all. I think they're... You guys are all from different walks of life, and, you know, there are football, ex-football players, baseball players, you know, track and field stars. Uh, I, it just was amazing to me the type of uh, level of these uh, athletes that I, I was working with, and they picked up so quick, and it was something that I just enjoyed doing. And so we ended up on American Gladiators Arena on the, on the middle of the floor, It'll be, you know, you know, the, the contestants and the gladiators were all out there with me, and we just kind of started learning Muay Thai, and I, and I loved teaching it, so it was fun, and it's just an experience I'll never forget. How many of the gladiators trained with you? Oh, there was probably, uh, I would say, half of them. Did any of the gladiators have formal martial art training in their background before this? 
You know, uh, I think Dallas was about the only one that really had any kind of background in, in, in martial arts. She loved to fight, you know. She became, we trained pretty hard, her and I, and we used to uh, pretty much, you know, we'd go to her place and we'd um, end up in her garage. She set it up like a gym and we'd sit there and we'd work out, you know, a few hours at a time. But she ended up uh, taking that to uh, the toughest woman in the world contest, and she won it twice. Do any of the American gladiators still train with you today? Uh, about the only one uh, is that really does train with me. Is uh, that comes that, that comes around once in a while is, is Dallas, because we stayed you know, we stayed really close. In fact, she's in Florida right now, and she's coming out this way. Uh, she got sponsors. Going to be going to Hawaii for a big fight show. She's got a couple of her fighters that she's training now, and uh, she took it to a different level. She just fell in love with it. So now she teaches boxing, Muay Thai, and, and MMA, and she's got her own gym, and she's doing the same thing. I, and it's great because it's great to see people that you, that you care about and that you've worked with in the past turn this into something that's a lifestyle. And, and what they do with it is they help others, and, and that's what we're supposed to do anyway. You know, as as a pioneer, I think I'm a pioneer because of all the years I've been doing this, that I had a lot of students that are out there and they're training people today. And I watch their students that come by, they bring them in and say, what do you think, uh, coach? And I go, I'm amazed. You know, it, it blows me away how well they, they, they've uh, taught them and, and how much knowledge they've learned from teaching. Because that's when you really learn is when you're teaching somebody. You got to start analyzing what you have, uh, what was given to you from your mentors. And I have uh, two great mentors in my life, and I was very fortunate to have trained with Saxon Janjira, who is the legendary Thai fighter that came from Thailand back. And then you can look him up on the internet, he's got all kinds of accolades. I mean, uh, I don't even want to go there. <laughs> Sometimes some of the things are funny, but, sure. but you'll see on the internet he's quite, he's quite an amazing character. And uh, you'll see me in his corner in a lot of his fights. And then my, my Hawaiian teacher, uh, uh, Kolomono Kaivalu, and uh, I was been with him ever since I was a young boy. So it's, uh, uh, it's just a, an amazing life that I've had, and I just can't even explain the, the career that I've, it, it's, it's helped me walk through and the paths I've taken and, and the people I've met. It's just one step to another, another path, another path. And it just opened so many doors, and I'm just kind of feel this has been a blessing. You said a moment ago that you learn the more you teach. Would you say that somebody who is a teacher is has has an advantage over somebody who's never been an instructor in terms of progressing their skills even further? Well, there's two ways of looking at that. You know, sometimes I was very fortunate in my life, uh, I crossed paths with Ruben Urquidez back in the day, Benny the Jet's uh, brother. And uh, him and I worked together for a period of years in, the, in promoting fight shows and, uh, and opening up gyms. One of the things I remember him saying to me is when we're teaching fighters, he was saying, you know, Dave, and, and one of the questions that came up because it was a discussion we had, and he said that um, the best fighters that I've ever had were students who had a martial arts background. And, and the reason why is because they had a discipline already. It was easy for them to make a transition into kickboxing. And uh, that's what they were teaching back then. So knowing that, it has really, really, really uh, helped with people today that are teaching. So I think someone who's had a, a martial arts background, who's had uh, a history of understanding their body, and then taking that to the next level in teaching, is a better a better qualified instructor than someone who 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 didn't analyze what they were learning and and you know it's like you know we used to laugh about it uh, taekwondo take your dough taekwondo and then you get a, you go you get a guy that 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 learns for two years get his black belt and go open up a, a, a dojo and to me that's wrong you know because he really doesn't understand the foundations or the or the or the uh, the the martial art, the whole spectrum of the martial art, because you really have to understand what it's what what you're putting somebody through, and you could take somebody and teach them wrong, and then they get into a situation and they get hurt. Giving a black belt to somebody that 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 
isn't qualified to have a black belt, why would somebody get a black belt if they, if they really don't know how to protect themselves? And, and, and putting a black belt on a kid, I mean, to me that was wrong because if you have a, a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old black belt, maybe to another kid he's going to be bad, but to an adult, you know, what's he doing with it? You know, it, it, it kind of puts him in a situation, and then it puts him in a situation in school where if someone knew that he had a black belt, now you've got people ready to, let's find out if he really is a black belt. And I can see people picking on it. I've seen that a lot. So I, I've, I've learned throughout the years to be, I'm pretty judgmental, I would say, on certain uh, instructions in, in people because I see it even in our business today in the Muay Thai world. I see fighters out there today or teachers today opening up gyms, taking on students and teaching them, and I don't see the knowledge. And there is, a, there is a thing about knowledge, and it really is important that what you teach somebody, is, especially if you're teaching them how to protect themselves, you should have a background. If you don't have a background and you've been in the business for a year or two and you go open up a gym, oh, this is easy because I can make money at it. To me, it's like having a McDonald's on every corner, and, and that's kind of a shame in, in my business and when they start doing that, and I see that a lot now. Does a child have the, the life lessons and the character lessons to be a black belt? Um, I think a child, when you get a child in your gym or in your school or your halal or your dojo, it's like giving a, it's like getting a piece of clay and you take that piece of clay and you put it in front of you and you start to mold them. And you give them the things that you'd want, you know, the right, the right attitude, the right somebody walks in your even today my kids they walk in but even though they're learning muay thai and or they're learning kickboxing or boxing or or, or jujitsu whatever our programs is, are in the in the school the kids walk in the first thing i say to the i say to them i said when you walk in the gym the first thing is you is you bow it all starts there and 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 they all they ask me well why just bow and you have to trust me on, on this one here and the kids look at me, okay, sir. So they bow. And I says, and my name is either Coach or Clue David or Sensei or whatever you feel. It's called, you give me a title and you call me Coach, it's okay. But the most important thing is you never call me by my first name in front of people. And I said, so I want that as a, as a life lesson from the beginning. And now the kids, they walk in and they, uh, hello, sir, and they salute and they, and they walk in and they show some respect. And when they walk on the floor, they bow again, and they walk on the foot, then they start to train. And before they even start sparring or something, they always bow first. And it's just tradition, and maybe it's old school or whatever you want to call it, but it starts there. And then as you groom them as they go, what you get back from them is much more than just fighting and much more than just, you know, uh, I'm going to teach you how to fight with weapons or I'm going to teach you how to, how to beat somebody up or how to... Protect it. It's what they get out of it to teach their children, because what I see today, in our world today, and what I'm watching on, the, because of the internet and all the stuff that's happening, it is really hard to engage into the politics of today. But it's better to engage from a different corner, from a different place. A small. I have a small little place, so I, I engage my world with those kids, and I start there and say that's what I give back. That's all you ever can do. And hopefully those kids will turn out the way you want them to turn out and they'll be better people in the future because, you know what, there's this generation today I call the mad generation. <laughs> there's a lot of mad kids out there and, I, and they walk into my, into, my, into my school and I just, I have to almost close my eyes and say, okay, I've got to think about this. How am I going to approach this kid to make him change? Because they come in with attitudes and very young. You know, so that's where I'm at today as far as teaching goes. Sounds like you take teaching on as a responsibility. It is a responsibility. You don't want to have somebody learn something and go out and misuse it on somebody. It's not, that's not what we're given these tools for. You know, uh, I, I don't look at that. I mean, I remember, you know, the only reason why I ever learned was because of that was picked on so much in school and I ended up, you know, all the way from junior high school all the way to I graduated. It was like a war. You know, I, I, I didn't even, there was, wasn't a week or a time in my life 
that I don't recall having having to step into the into uh, the a field or into a, into a, 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 into a room somewhere in someone's backyard, you know, having to defend myself and fight one, two, sometimes six people, and I didn't like it, but I did it, and I ended up having to do that because I had to survive. And then I said, you know what? I'm going to fight. And then somebody one day, you know, when I was at a back in those days, we had uh, in the '60s we had the Lovins and you know. Yeah, Hare Krishna and you know peace and all that and the war was going on but I remember as a as a 15 year old I was sitting there in some field and some guy walked by me and the place was packed with people big you know music going on everywhere and this guy walked by us and said hey and he says, you want to see me beat those two guys up over there that are picking on people and I said uh, he says why uh, why he goes, I just want to show you guys something. He was recruiting. I didn't even know he was recruiting. So I said, sure, why not? And uh, so he says, he walks and taps on these two guys' for, uh, shoulders, and they're big guys. He says, hey, you guys are looking for someone to fight, right? And he said, they go, yeah. He said, well, fight me. I'm smaller than you, but I'll fight both of you. And they said, really? Well, next thing you know, we're behind the barn, and this guy's just beating the daylights out of him. And I said, I'm in. <laughs> so I joined martial arts at that point, and I've been at it ever since. David, do you teach multiple styles? Um, yeah, I do. So I teach uh, my Polynesian art. I'll always teach that to my students. I teach the concepts. I teach boxing because I boxed. Um, I teach uh, um, kickboxing because I kickboxed as, as a young guy. And then I, uh, I teach Muay Thai is what I train. I, I learned from my mentor, Saxon. So uh, those are the styles I teach. And then I have a, a jiu-jitsu friend. My, my stand-up is like jiu-jitsu in the Hawaiian arts. But my, and then we go to the ground, but not like the jiu-jitsu guys. I don't believe I need to go to the ground. I'd rather run if I get a chance. <laughs> Do you have one prevalent foundation style? Not really. Not really. I, it's just whatever I'm standing in. And uh, it's me reading the other person. I'm going to know what their, what their body language is. I study somebody's body right off the bat, and I know basically what they can throw from that, from that stance, or I, I read the way their body muscles tense up or something like that, and I know what to expect before it happens. So I'm ready. You know, I'm always that way, even at this age. <laughs> and tell us about your Polynesian style. Kind of, we call the Hawaiians call it lomi lomi, the old school called it lomi lomi. The hands of massage. They learn massage, and from learning massage, they learn the the, the muscles in the body. They learn the nerves in the body. They know how to manipulate someone's uh, body. Um, but everything is basically the the. If you look at the foundation of all martial arts, it's basically all the same, but it's how you apply it, and the principles of being able to hit somebody. Uh, or strike somebody back because you have to be almost a, a defensive with an offensive move and uh, basically that's the Hawaiian style and you want to take them, sweep them down, put them in a lock before they ever hit the floor you know, as they're moving down you want to have them in a lock so when they hit the floor they, they actually break themselves by landing the wrong way or they, or they don't know how to land but yeah, it works <laughs> I, mean, I hate to say it but yeah, it works <laughs> A lot of students today consider it a privilege to train under an accomplished master, but conversely, is it a privilege to teach? Being able to teach somebody and, and getting results as a teacher, I think, uh, is probably the most rewarding thing I've ever done. David, are there martial artists who you admire? I respect martial artists who have character, and I love the characters of the martial I love who they are, but they're the right kind of uh, aura, if you want to call it that. But you'll, you'll see them. I, I, and uh, there's so many. And, uh, I, and when you meet them, you know. You know as, a, as, a, as a teacher, you know. As, a, as, a, uh, as one of the people who have been teaching for, like, I've been doing this for, what, 48 years now? <laughs> a lot of years. So... I see. I've seen a lot, and in all in all aspects, there's the boxing people. Uh, I have my friends like Carlos Palomino. I just love to death, you know, and 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 what a great inspiration.
he is to the, the world of boxing. And people like uh, my teacher, Kolomono Kaivalu, he's the same way. I mean, I have my, the, the people that I respect, you know, uh, they haven't, they never stop. And they're in their 80s, and they're still going, and they're still trying to teach. Um, Saxon Janjira, I, I have to go back to him from the beginning. The first time I ever met Saxon, I, I just couldn't believe the character he was and how much he loved his students. He loves teaching. He, lo he loves to share what he, his knowledge. And it's all about community. And in this business, you have to have community. And without community, you can never, ever, uh, how can you share without it? You know, and, and you have to share your beliefs. And people stick around because of that. So I, I can say, you know, Benny the Jet, I can go on and on and on, and, you know, it's never ending. And uh, Gene LaBelle, I mean, I love Gene. He's funny as hell. <laughs> That's got to get back his video. I still have it. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to my interview with Master David Crapes on Martial Arts World Radio. This is UFC fighter Jason Sago. You are now listening to Martial Arts World Radio with Joseph Clark. In several episodes of Martial Arts World Radio, the most popular answer that I get from world champions and UFC fighters to the question, who is your favorite martial artist, is Bruce Lee. Hands down, he is always the favorite, or almost always the favorite. So let's do a little bit of reflecting on Bruce Lee. In the history of the martial arts, probably no one has done as much to popularize them especially in the West, as Bruce Lee. When he began training in the Wing Chun system of Gung Fu in 1954, there was no particular indication of the extraordinary success he would later achieve. He was to later create Jeet Kune Do, his way of the intercepting fist, a philosophy which he taught to many celebrities like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, James Coburn, Sterling Siliphant, and many others. He'd thrill crowds with his demonstrations, and he became a superstar with his martial arts films. Arriving in the U.S. in, 18, in 1959, Lee enrolled in the University of Washington at Seattle as a student of philosophy, where he met and married his wife, Linda. He later gave lessons part-time to finance his education, building a moderate following before moving to Oakland in 1964 to open his first full-time Kuhn Gym with the late James Lee. That same year, when Bruce demonstrated at the International Karate Championships in Long Beach, he was discovered by a producer and asked to play the role of Cato in the television series Green Hornet. When the short-lived series was canceled in 1968, Bruce went on to later appear in Marlowe with his student James Garner and in several segments of the Long Street TV series with James Franciscus, another of Lee's celebrity students. In 1971, Bruce turned down a co-starring role in Longstreet in favor of an offer to do a series of movies with producer Raymond Chow in Hong Kong. Their first project, The Big Boss, a.k.a. Fists of Fury, broke all box office records in Hong Kong, surpassing the long-standing hit Sound of Music. It then began to break records in other countries like Singapore, Malaysia, and the Philippines. Fists of Fury, a.k.a. Chinese Connection, Lee's second film eclipsed the success of its predecessor and catapulted him to stardom as the biggest box office draw in the history of Asian cinema. Shortly afterward, the muscular superstar formed Concord Productions with Chow, and they produced their first, and Bruce's third, movie, Way of the Dragon, Return of the Dragon in the U.S. Bruce wrote, directed, stunt coordinated, starred, and co-produced in the film. The film also co-starred Chuck Norris and Bob Wall. Lee's third film proved even more successful than his previous endeavors and led Warner Brothers into co-producing the phenomenally popular Enter the Dragon, which is now considered the classic martial arts film. This is world champion Steve Nasty Anderson. You are listening to Martial Arts World Radio with Joseph Clark. Our next guest is a five-time world kickboxing champion and world boxing champion. She was inducted into the Black Belt, Black Belt Magazine's Black Belt Hall of Fame. She is a prolific stunt woman and actor. She has played herself in HBO's boxing video game. 
She's been a stunt double in movies such as Watchmen, Transformers, Iron Man 2, Million Dollar Baby, The Twilight Saga, Breaking Dawn 1 and 2. The list of incredible films and TV productions on her resume is just simply massive. And she was a performer in the Power Rangers television show. Ladies and gentlemen, there is only one Bridget Baby Doll Riley. Bridget, welcome to Martial Arts World Radio. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> oh my gosh, that introduction. I'm like <laughs> humbled. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me, Joseph. What a pleasure. And you are most welcome, and you've earned it. Bridget, what was your most memorable title fight? Was it kickboxing or boxing? Well, that's a really good question. Um, because, you know, my heart, my, my first love <laughs> was completely uh, karate, the martial arts, karate tournaments, kickboxing, and then boxing, of course. But um, I have to say it is my very first world title defense in boxing. I was defending my bantamweight IFBA uh, championship. And um, it was live on ESPN2, and everybody was watching, my entire family, and it was my very first defense. I'm like, really? It couldn't be like my 10th. It really, this had to happen on my first. I got dropped, like, I mean dropped the first round. And Richard Steele, who, you know, people in boxing know, it, he was a bit controversial, and um, he was a referee. So he easily could have stopped it, and I don't even know what happened. Honestly, I, I, uh, when you enter that realm as a fighter in the ring, uh, it's weird. It's a weird thing. You know, it'll make you or break you. And somehow I got back up. I barely made the count of eight. I don't remember getting up. I believe it was the hand of God. And Richard still looked at me dead, you know, dead in the eyes, and he said, are you okay to continue? And I was like, yeah. Well, I don't remember that. I have no recollection of that. Barely survived, I barely, barely survived that round. And I, um, by the grace of God, came back, and I knocked her out cold in the ninth. And it was one of those, you know, one of those uh, <laughs> crazy fights. And at what age did you begin training in martial arts? Oh, good God, age. <laughs> um, it was a long time ago. I, I, I was a gymnast when I was little. And my brother was in karate, who, um, Patrick Riley, who was like my hero. And, um, I was, I was a teenager. Uh, it was a difficult decision to choose to leave gymnastics because my parents invested. We didn't have a lot of money. We were very, um, you know, we, we struggled and we, uh, everybody sacrificed in my family for my gymnastics. So, um, and I was going seven days a week. By the time I stopped gymnastics, it was it was a full time job. I mean, it was five and a half hours every day. I had no life, and I I loved it. I I was the first in the gym and the last to leave every time. But um, I would go to my brother's karate tournaments, and it <laughs> it was it was so cool. And you know, I just saw the camaraderie at these tournaments and the point fighting and the kata and the weapons. And I was like, Mom. Uh, and, you know, we would sit down as a family at, at the table and have these family discussions. And I said, you know, Mom, and I was really scared and nervous. And, you know, um, my mom was so awesome. She said, honey, if you're really done, let's let's be done with it. You know, we're not going to push you. And I go, yeah, but you, you put so much money into it. And um, she goes, what do you want to do? And I go, I want to do karate. I want to go to karate. And I was terrified. I, it took me, I went four weeks watching class, watching my brother at the dojo, and they kept saying, jump in, you know, come on, jump in, jump in. I was, I was really afraid. I'm not, I'm not too proud to admit that. And finally I just did it, and I was home. I was home. I mean, it was just like, wow. <laughs> so I was a teenager, and that's when I got my, you know, I started as a white belt and worked my way up from there. So tell us about getting the call from Black Belt Magazine that they were going to induct you in the Hall of Fame. What was that like? <laughs> oh, my gosh. I was like, seriously, me? <laughs> There's so many better people. Um, it, was, it was amazing because I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. And um, before I moved to California to train at the World Famous Jet Center, um, my brother and my dad would always shove these magazines, like Black Belt Magazine, all the magazines, all the karate magazines, in front of my face. And they're like, look at this cover. And it, I, I saw Kathy Long, you know, 
on the cover. And they're like, that, you know, you need to go there. You need to go to California. And so it, it was always my dream to go to California and to train with the best and then to be on a cover, which eventually happened. It took a while. But then, you know, just as a complete bonus, they inducted me and put me in. Um, it was um, extremely humbling, and I was ex- so thankful. And I'm still, like, really? <laughs> like, just me? Like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know if I deserve it. But it was really cool. So, Bridget, so My dad passed away, so he didn't get to see it. But I know he's in heaven, and I really feel him. Um, I feel him. I, 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 know he, I know he's seeing it all, you know. But it, it, it's a bummer, you know, because... God, he was he, he was like my number one fan, my biggest support, and he loved the entertainment industry, which I got into that just as a fluke and by total accident. And he would have loved that, though. We would play Trivia Pursuit as a family, and I couldn't even, like, I probably couldn't even get first grade level questions. And my dad was on the main one, and he could get every single entertainment trivia question, period, and I just, you know, there's a part of me that I really wish he was here to see it all. Bridget, why did you become a professional fighter? Hmm. Oh, how could I not? How could I not? Uh, it, it really is that thing. It's, I don't know what that is. I, I honestly have tried to figure that one out. But um, when I would be in karate tournaments, and karate, yes, it is a game of tag, but it would get rough. I mean, it would get really rough. And, yeah, you, you hit, you got to be fast, you got to be first, and then you break, and they call for a point. But I loved it. I loved the camaraderie. I loved my brother and all his friends and the team and, like, just everybody in these karate tournaments. And that's how I got hooked. And I was just done. And I liked it. And I was good at it. And I, I liked being good at it because I wasn't very um, – I wasn't – I was kind of a dork and a tomboy, and I had my big Coke bottle glasses when I was little. And, you know, girls made fun of me, and girls were really mean. And they were really mean to me. And I found something that I could do, and I could feel good about myself. And I learned confidence in the martial arts, and I learned dignity, and I learned respect and self-respect. I learned all these things, and, um, you know, alongside with my my family. And one thing led to the next. You know, I segued from karate into while well, I was getting disqualified. I like I like to bang, man. I like to I like to hit. I didn't like to stop. Like let's keep going. What's the problem here? So that's when they said maybe you should think about you know um, continuous fighting. And Mr. Jim Boucher was my first um, kickboxing trainer back in St. Louis. Uh, we fought in Belleville, and he goes, "Hey, baby doll." And he's the one that named me baby doll. He goes, "You look like a little baby doll." He goes, and, and it just stuck with me. And he goes, you want to try kickboxing? I said, yes. My boyfriend was doing it. My brother was doing it. All the guys in the gym were doing it. Heck yeah. Let's do this. So that is when I was like, yes. And there weren't, there wasn't amateur back then. And it was, you know, it was a while ago. And uh, if I wanted to fight, they were like, well, you're, you're, hey, guess what? You got to go pro first fight. Hey, no problem. And P.S. You're going to fight the U.S. champion. Awesome. <laughs> I was like, let's go. No pressure. No pressure. But it was so, you know, it's funny because, you know, you, I see, like, as as the sport has progressed and, um, you know, through the years, I would I would see girls, or, and, and, you know, I'm not going to mention any names, but I would, I would hear people, you know, because I'm in L.A. I moved to L.A. and, you know, you, you hear all these stories and you, you hear these people like they want to they want to pick their fights or they want girls that, you know, I don't know, they dig them out of the ground. Like I want I fought everybody at first. I mean, and not every fight was a war. Most of them were. And at first they definitely were. I was way in over my head a lot of the times. I think that builds character. I think you find out real quick. You either have it or you don't. And you have the heart. You can't be taught that you have it or you don't. Who was your toughest competitor, Bridget? Hmm. There's been quite a few of them. Um, oh, let's see. Bonnie Canino, absolutely in kickboxing. I remember watching her fight Kathy Long going the distance, and she looked really scary and um, very scary. And I was like, whoa. And, there, and I fought her the, 
the first time, and she beat me in my hometown. <laughs> it's heartbreaking. That builds character, though. Um, you, uh, I think some of my losses, my biggest losses, were the best learning experiences in my life, and I wouldn't have moved to California had I not gotten my butt kicked and handed to me so bonnie canino definitely i rematched her and um got taken out of that ring and a stretcher on the rematch but i won two world titles that night and it was 12 rounds and it was amazing um she was tough she was really really tough in boxing um yvonne trevino she was the champion i took the title from her you have to really be the champion to take their title away she was tough uh brenda burnside when i fought at madison square garden on evander holyfield lewis won um, that was amazing. She was really strong. And you know what? You better have a good corner because sometimes when we're out there, um, I like to bang. If you put me in a phone booth, let's, let's do this. I like inside fighting. I don't like to move around a whole lot. Even though I have that, I have that in my back pocket from karate. Um, but, uh, sometimes you really got to listen to your, your corner. And that's hard to do sometimes when you're in the ring because, it's such tunnel vision, and you're so in this thing, and when you start getting thumped and when you start cracking on a girl that you're used to, well, in other fights, this punch dropped her or this punch really hurt her, and it's not even, it's not even making a dent. That takes you to another place as a fighter in that ring, and you can't panic. You can't, and all these fighters that say, oh, I'm never nervous, Baloney. Every time I've gotten in that ring, I'm nervous. I'm afraid of looking bad. I'm not afraid of getting hurt. That doesn't scare me. I'm afraid of looking bad. I'm afraid of losing, and that motivates me. Bridget, on this show, we have interviewed Lindsay Garbat, another world champion who transitioned from boxing to MMA. We've also interviewed your friend, Fridia Gibbs, who transitioned from kickboxing to boxing. What compelled you to transition from kickboxing to boxing? First, I want to say I love Fridia. We go way back together, and she is the reason I have this connection with you, Joseph, and I'm so grateful to her, and I'm so proud of her. As am she I. She has her own radio show and her own book, and I'm absolutely inspired. And, um, yeah, she's a good girl, man, and, and an incredible athlete, so I just want to give a shout-out to her. But, um, wow, well, I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> Why did you transition from kickboxing to boxing? Oh, well, I was in a heavily um, boxing uh, team, my camp. Uh, I moved to St. Louis with 100 bucks in my pocket, drove out from St. Louis, landed at the Jet Center, the original Jet Center, the world-famous Jet Center, on fire in Van Nuys, California. And I showed up, didn't know anything. All I knew is my brother said, this is where you have to go if you really want to do this. And I'm like, Yeah. Um, I show up, there's a sign that says, train for the day for $15. I happen to get to see Sensei Benny the Jet Yukita's there. And I have my $15, I had it out so fast. You know, I was like, here, 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 here sir. And um, he goes, put your money away. Keep your money. And he goes, well, what are you, you know, what are you doing here? And I go, well, I'm here to become the world champion. And um, <laughs> that's who I trained with. And his sister, Lily, my mentor, my everything, and her husband, Blinky uh, Rodriguez, they took me over. They watched me spar, and they took me over. And um, that was, for me, like winning the lottery. That was, that was it. They said, if you're serious, uh, you know, we're going to do this. We're going to manage you. They were heavily into boxing. They had a really strong, I mean, they were around boxers. They were Hector Lopez. I mean, what's his, like, well, they were around constant boxing. They had a... Um, so my, my kickboxing training through them uh, was a lot of boxing. So I think I had an advantage in my kickboxing fights because I had good hands, I had fast hands, I had really good combinations, punches and bunches. And I started seeing Christy Martin, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, I need that. I, I, I need to be there. And I was hard. You know, like Blinky even said, God, i got to micromanage you. Like, I, I, was, I was, you know, we're fighters, we're you know, you have, there's a certain sense of ego in that, you know, you, you want to have that humility and, but you're, you're still at the end of the day, you're a freaking fighter. And I'm like, I want that. Put me in there, man. How do we make this happen? So they're like, let's start putting you in boxing. And a lot of fights in kickboxing were falling out and people didn't want to fight me. Um, the more and more I grew. And so we're like, 
hey, if this is an avenue to get more fights, let's do this. Now, Bridget, we're coming up to the top of the hour. Therefore, we have to close off the show. There's never enough time. We're just scratching the surface here. However, last question or two. Where does your strength Mm -hmm. come from? Where does my what come from? Your strength. My strength comes from the Lord Jesus Christ, 1,000%. And, um, <laughs> and I'm a very hard worker. Uh, you, you, uh, I have a very hard work ethic, and, and for some reason I've been with amazing people, wonderful, wonderful people who have uh, mentored me and taught me and trained me and schooled me and taught, and I am a 1,000% grateful for all of that and I have a um, um I ha- my dad passed away but I have an amazing stepdad and my mom uh my family's tight and they're solid um I have a very small circle I'm a loner but but uh it's really really awesome <laughs> Bridget thank you so much for being here we look forward to having you back real soon congratulations on your legacy and best of luck on your further adventures thanks again Thank you so much. God bless, Joseph. I really appreciate it. And everybody listening, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. And God bless you as well. This has been an interview with world champion kickboxer, world champion boxer, world champion stunt woman, just world champion human being, Bridget Baby Doll Riley. Be sure to check us out at www.mawradio.com and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube by following Martial Arts World Radio. I'm Joseph Clark wishing you safe travels. Thank you for listening.